I want to welcome all of His Glory Nation as we continue our series in Deuteronomy. Tonight we'll be in Deuteronomy 31. And as we always do, we pray that the Holy Spirit will come down from east to west to north to south to be the true teacher in the living Word of God, which is our Savior, Christ the Lord. Interesting, number 31. 31 is, the rabbis will tell you, is the number of Yahweh, the unpronounceable uh, letters of God in the numerical value. So 31, uh, what is interesting, uh, speaking of God and how wonderful he is in, in um, his book, um, it was uh, Martin Luther, uh, the, 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 the starter of um, the, the Lutheran church, who tried to get the book of Esther thrown out of the canon. And the reason, his, the reason for that was that there was no mention of Je Jehovah in, uh, in Esther. It was a great story, but... Um, what did this have to do? Kind of a, a, a look at replacement theology, if you will. Why does Israel matter and the churches replace that? And then the rabbis have d discovered in a code in the book of Esther, the name Yahweh, in, or um, I'm sorry, the name uh, Yehovah, which means three in Hebrew, is coded in the book of Esther 31 times. So God, through the Holy Spirit, anticipated a blasphemy that uh, his his name wasn't in the book of Esther and it wasn't of importance and literally put his name there 31 times identifying his number 31 praise his name so let's start uh, the number of God 31 then Moses went up and spoke these words to all of Israel and he said to them I am 120 years old today I can no longer go out and come in also, Jehovah has said to me, you shall not cross over this Jordan. So Mo Moses has gotten to the end of the road where God has said that it's going to be Joshua that will take the people through the Jordan. And as you can see that in our study in, in Joshua, um, Joshua indeed did that. They took out uh, Sion and Og, the king of Bashan, the demonic uh, kings, the gigantes, uh, which the scripture tells us they were 12 foot tall on the on the uh, this side of the Jordan, but they, God is going to part them in the book of Joshua, the Jordan, and go in and eliminate the rest of the kings. And interesting in the book of King or in the book of Joshua, the number of kings is exactly 31 as well. God showing that there is one God who is above all kings, and it is Jehovah, God in three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and our King of Kings and Lord of Hosts, Messiah. Uh, Messiah ben David is on his way for his second and imminent return to sit on the throne of King David and usher in the thousand-year reign and the Davidic covenant. Okay, so that, that's where we're at. Moses is 120. It's interesting that Moses, uh, God said that the, the perfect age is 120. Moses lived 120, and it was breaking down, broken down uh, into 40 wilderness periods. The first 40 was is in, in uh, under the Egyptian uh, pharaoh uh, and his daughter's um, uh, favor. Then 40 years uh, in the wilderness where he met his, his wife, Sipporah, and his, had his children and, and, and Jethro, and then the 40 years in the wilderness. And the Lord took, took him out because of her striking the rock twice, and he didn't do that. Um, it's my it's my conjecture that Moses is coming back again. He will be one of the two uh, witnesses in the Book of Revelation. Him and uh, Elijah. We know uh, that Elijah is indeed one of them. We have Passover coming up this week, and the Jewish people uh, always set an extra place for Elijah because they know the coming of Elijah is near. And if you study our, our commentaries on the gospel, uh, that was what was asked of John the Baptist, are you Elijah? But it was the spirit of Elijah with him. He literally was wearing the mantle of Elijah. Okay, so do that's where we, sta we stand. He shall not cross the Jordan, and, and now he's going to speak on behalf of the Lord. The, the Jehovah, your Elohim, himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these nations from before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord had said. So the Lord said that Joshua would inherit the land and lead these people, Israel. Remember, Caleb and Joshua were the only two that came back as witnesses that, that believed in God, that believed in Elohim that could deliver them from these gigantes. It was a beautiful land, but 10 of the, 10 of the reports that came back said that they're giants. There's no way we can take them out. They have fortified walls. They're giants. But the faith of Caleb and the faith of Joshua... And the next generation allowed them to go in and take over the land of milk and honey because God is with you who can be against you. And God is with them. He's going beforehand. And if we trust in the Lord, he always goes beforehand and clears the way for us. And he's holding our hand the whole way. 
That's why we have to seek his face. And we're going to see some learning lessons here with, with, with the Israelites uh, throughout history. When they turn their heart to the Lord, the Lord responds, responds back and is a loving God and has incredible patience and redeems them. And we see over and over again, then they, then they rebel, and then they come back, and then they rebel. And in the end times, uh, which we're coming upon now, um, they will seek his face. As the scripture says in prophecy, that in, 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 the, in the time of their turmoil, they will seek his face and he will return to the place that he left, meaning return to his people Israel. We see that in Ezekiel 37, the dry bones, that the nation of Israel, the remnant, not secular Israel, but the remnant will understand that Messiah ben David is Jesus Christ and they will accept him. We're seeing more Jews come to Christ than any time in the history, so we know his time is soon. Verse 4, and, the, and Jehovah will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, in their land when he destroyed them. Again, those were the gigantes or the Nephilim or Rephaphim. They were a tainted DNA. They were not normal. They were possessed. They were demon. They were big. Uh, again, the scripture tells us Og was 12 foot tall. The, the, the Jehovah will give them over to you that you may do to them according to every commandment which I have commanded you. So God is going to give them a commandment. He's giving them into these land of giants. Uh, be strong and good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. Don't be afraid. Be of good courage. Just like Joshua and Caleb had. Be strong and courageous because if the Lord is for you, who can be against you? He who is in you is stronger than he, in you, he, he who is in the world. And no weapon ever formed can stand against what God has ordained for his, his beloved. And that's what we have to take, uh, to take our strength in is Christ. Christ Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit. They go before us and pave the way. And we trust that they open the door and we walk through it hand in hand with them because of our faith. And we know he is a great God, a loving God, and he wants our best interests. He wants our heart and he wants our obedience. We're going to see this over and over in Deuteronomy 31. God is a God of love. He's a God of, of, of restoration. He is always a patient God. He always comes back and gives second, third, fourth, fifth, un, un, unlimited amount of chances because he loves us so much that he wants to give us uh, every opportunity, even though when we have a hardened heart, you know, there's a penalty for that, but he is a gracious God if we'll humble ourselves and seek his face and be obedient to him. Uh, the Jehovah, your Elohim, he is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you, nor will he today. When you got God with you through Jesus Christ, he will never leave you. It may look dark and tomorrow may look bleak, but as it says, there will be weeping at night, but there will, there, there will be uh, rejoicing in the morning in the, in the book of Psalms. And that is so true that the Lord, even in the darkest times, he has our back. He's walking before us. He's opening up a door that will be greater if we have that faith and trust in him, because with him all things are possible. Verse 7, Then Moses called Joshua and said to him in the sight of all of Israel, Be strong and of good courage, for you must go with the people to the land which the Jehovah has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall cause them to inherit it. So he's swearing in his, his uh, mentor, or mentoree, Joshua, Yeshua, the first Yeshua. Again, remember even our study of uh, the book of Joshua in Hebrew, it means Yeshua, as same as Jesus is Yeshua, and it's a foreshadowing of the book of Revelation. And the Lord, he is one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. Do not fear or be dismayed. He goes before you. Nothing in this world they can do to you other than kill you. And if you have Christ in your heart, death is the beginning. It says, uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, it's more important uh, of your the day of your death than it is the day of your birth, if you're in Christ, because that's where your life truly begins for eternity. Again, we are just passing pilgrims here to be tested. Do we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, or do we accept anything else? God wants our heart, and it's uh, in a, a, a version of the book of Job. With all the trials and tribulations, do we stay strong with God? Even when the world says, curse God and die. Even your wife telling you, curse God and die. Job didn't. He stood strong. And God rewarded him for it. He didn't know God was testing him. And he didn't know God was there the whole time. But he had faith. And God came through. And God always comes through. He's a loving God. Praise his name. Uh, so Moses wrote the law and delivered to the priests, the sons of Levi, who bore the Ark of the Covenant of, the, of Jehovah to all the elders of Israel. So they, did, uh, the, the, they took the law that Moses wrote. The Ark of the Covenant, which has the Ten Commandments in, and um, the, the, uh, the, the, the staff. 
Verse 10, And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years, at the appointed time in the year of release, at the festival of uh, Feast of Tabernacles. So the year of release means the, um, the Shemitah. After the end of the Shemitah, we, we studied in the law, is with the year of release, the release of debt. Let the land lay empty, let it rest. Seven is always the day of, the day of rest. And the, the, they will read these on the Feast of Tabernacles. God always puts uh, more really important things around his festivals. We're coming up to the first festival on the Hebrew calendar, which is the, this Friday at sundown. And that is Passover, and Passover represents them coming out of Egypt, uh, the Israelites, and also our Passover lamb, which is Christ the Lord. And then uh, after that is first fruits, which is the same day that Jesus Christ uh, came, became the first fruit of God, and our first fruit and became the, uh, the high priest in the order of Melchizedek and sits at the right hand of the Father. And then the whole week is the week of unleavened bread. And then the next festival is 49 days later, which is Shabbat or uh, Pentecost, the day the church was born. The, the Jewish people say that's the day that God gave this, uh, the, the, the uh, Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. Interesting that the word of God is uh, uh, Jesus Christ, and that's when the church was born. And then we come up to the next one, which is Feast of Trumpets. And then after the Feast of the Trumpets, once they see the new moon come in, the, the, the shofars are blown. The next one is the Day of Atonement which is the only day in, on the Hebrew calendar that the high priest could go into the Holy Holies and make atonement for the innocent sin of the, the people. And then the last festival, the seventh festival, as we're talking here, the Feast of Tabernacles, where God tabernacles among us. And we've said many times that Jesus Christ has fulfilled all these events except for the last three, and the last three are coming. He has literally fulfilled... Um, it's interesting, Jonathan Kahn uh, has a, uh, a theory that I, I, I find very fascinating, and my conjecture is, I, I agree with him, that Jesus Christ was literally born on the 10th of Nisan. And the reason he says the 10th of Nisan, because God is always precise in everything. And the 10th of Nisan, if you look in the, in the law, was the day that you had to get the pure, the pure lamb ready for Passover. It's the 14th of Nisan, which is Passover. So Jesus literally fulfilled Passover as he was our Passover lamb. And he took, his, he took our sins to the cross so that we could have eternal life with him and through him, with obedience and surrendering our sins uh, to him. Um, and then the next one was he's, is the first fruit. Christ was risen on the first fruit um, on, that, on, that, on that Sunday. And that uh, he sits at the high, he sits the right hand of the Father as the high priest. And then the, the, he had the week of unleavened bread, and then the next one was Pentecost. Christ fulfilled Pentecost when he went up, and he said, "I baptize with fire," and that's when the Holy Ghost came down to the 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 the, the, the first church in the Book of Acts. So the next strategic thing on God's calendar through Jesus Christ, where he'll literally um, uh, literally fulfill, is what is called the Feast of Trumpets. And the Feast of Trumpets is the blowing of the shofar, and Paul refers to this in Thessalonica, and that's the last trump, and that is the, the long trump. It's the tekiah, the, the long blown out trump, the last trump. And I believe that has to do with the Feast of Trumpets, that that is a time frame where Christ will fulfill the Feast of Trumpets. And what is interesting about the Feast of Trumpets, you don't have a specific day where every other uh, of the festivals has a specific day. It's based on two witnesses seeing the moon come up to say when is the new moon, which ushers in the, um, the, the Feast of Trumpets. So Christ will fulfill the Feast of Trumpets, which will be the rapture. If you look in Thessalonica, and that's when he calls up the church. Those who, um, a twinkling of an eye, those who are dead will be raised first, and those who are alive will be with Christ in a resurrected body. Then you have the Day of Atonement. That's when Christ comes down and speaks the word and puts atonement once and for all and becomes the, the, the Goel, the land redeemer, the, 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 uh, the kinsman redeemer for the land and puts evil away and ushers in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ uh, for the Davidic covenant for a thousand years. And then the last festival is the Feast of Tabernacle. It means we will be tabernacling with God the Father, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit for eternity, those who have faith in our Lord and Savior and given their life to him. So that's a quick rundown of the seven festivals and why they're important to all people because even if you're a Gentile, we will be celebrating three of those festivals in the future. We will be celebrating Passover, we'll be celebrating Pentecost, and we'll be celebrating Feast of Tabernacles. 
Those are the three that are required by uh, the law that uh, everyone attend. Gather the people together, men and women and little ones and strangers who are within your gates, that they may hear and that they may learn to fear Jehovah your Elohim and carefully observe all the words of this law. So he, it's saying, teach the generations of the children. Teach them the way of the Lord. Teach them this is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 13, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land which you crossed the Jordan to possess. They weren't in the, the wilderness. They were not teaching their children. And these children are going to go and inherit the land. So God is telling them the way of the Lord so that it will go well with them. And uh, it's up to the fathers and the mothers to teach our children the way of the Lord and to fear him and love him and give him your heart, your soul, and mind. And he even says to strangers, so the, the, the stranger in the land, the foreigner, as long as they have faith in, in Jehovah, we're welcomed into the covenant of the Lord. And today it's the church. Christ died for each and every one, no matter what your tongue, nation, or tribe is from, all can become children of the Most High God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're all brothers and sisters once we accept Christ as our Savior. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourself in the tabernacle of meeting, that I may inaugurate him. So Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves to the tabernacle of meeting. So this is important meeting and pa passing on the baton, if you will. Verse 15, Now Jehovah appeared at the tabernacle in a pillar of cloud, and that is called his kavod, his essence, his glory. Uh, that's where we, again, got the name of the, this ministry. God gave us the name, gave my mother the name of this ministry. What should we name it? And he said, his glory, my glory. Kavod means the literal essence of God is what he's referring to. God's presence was in there. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you will rest with your fathers, and this people will rise and play the harlot with the gods of the, the, foreign, you know, the false gods of the foreigners of the land where they go to be among them, and they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. So God's already telling Moses exactly what's going to happen, and that's what they do. They continue to do that all through the scripture. Uh, we see that happen um, with Joshua, starting with Achan, and then in the judges, and then all through the kings, good king, bad king. Uh, Israel never had a good king. Uh, Judah would go good king, bad king, um, and then all the way up until you know the dry bones, where the second time they'll understand the remnant. And Israel is a... Uh, a promise for us to watch as Christians too. We we look at Israelites and say, how could they possibly do that? But we as Christians do the same thing, or non-believers do the same thing, as it says in um, the, the Proverbs, or D David says in Psalms, only a fool would know that there is no Elohim, meaning the one God, and. Um, we have to take that time to seek his face and know him and trust him and know his word and so it will go well with us and not to forget him, not to live in the world, not to get away from what he's taught us for, for uh, our own goodness and to be a light to others to say, those Christians are different. They walk a different walk. They have love in their heart. They have the love of Christ and that, that glows. And then we give our testimony and why we have that hope. It's because of Christ. Then my anger shall be aroused against them in that day, and I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils and troubles shall be befall them. So they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us because our God is not among us? I mean, our Elohim, saying he's left us. And he says, I left them that I'll return to the place again the second time. But God is so faithful. If you look at all the times, even, uh, even wicked kings like Ahab humbled himself and sought the face of the Lord, God responded. And all the bad things that Ahab, Ahab had done. And we're just like that. We sin uh, horribly. Of all the sins we've done past, present, and future, we, we have to give that up to Christ. And Christ is our Redeemer. And if we, forget, if we ask him to forgive our sins, he is faithful and true and he will forgive our sins. And we have to be obedient. We don't continue to sin. Jesus said to the woman when they wanted to stone her for, for uh, adultery, woman, go, your sins are forgiven, but don't sin anymore. Let's learn from our lesson and walk in the way of the Lord and be obedient. He wants obedience. Now, therefore, write down this song of yours and teach it to the children of Israel, and put it in their mouths, that the song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. When I have brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, then they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, that they will turn to the other gods and serve them, and they provoke me and break my covenant. They broke the covenant. Remember the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
is an everlasting covenant, but it's only to the remnant that have the heart for the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Obedient to the Lord. Doesn't mean all the nation of Israel that's secular that has a hardened heart. No. It's for those who can be grafted in, Gentiles as well, that love the Lord through, through the blood of Jesus Christ and ask for forgiveness and, and, and are obedient to him and his way. That's why it's so important to read the Bible every day and let it soak and meditate on your heart and the Holy Spirit works within you. Praise his holy name. And then it shall be with, with many evils and troubles have come upon them that the song will testify against them as a witness for it will, be, will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants for I know the inclination of their behavior today even before I have brought them to the land of which I swore to give them. So God saw the beginning and the end. He knew exactly how many times they were going to stumble. And it wasn't long after this that they started complaining and taking the booty in the book of Joshua with Achan when God said, do not do it. And he did it and hid it. Um, verse 22, therefore Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the children. God wanted to put the song so of a remembrance. God wants the words of his 66 books to be meditated on your heart so that you never forget. It's, uh, you know, people always ask, uh, sh you should memorize scripture. And I always say, no, don't memorize scripture because it's like in, in college or in high school where, where you had a, a, a test and you waited to the last minute and you crammed to try to get as much information just to pass that test. Well, you passed the test and maybe got a B or an A on it, but a, a day later you forgot all the answers that somebody asked you because it was memorization. God doesn't want you to memorize his word in an intellectual mind capacity. He wants it marinated on your heart. He wants your heart to be circumcised. He wants your heart to be open. And the scripture has to flow through your heart. And if it flow through your, flows through your heart, he gives you the supernatural wisdom that will automatically make you understand his scriptures, and then they will become memorized on your heart. Um, then he inaugurated Joshua the son of Nun and said, Be strong and good courage, for you shall bring the children of Israel into the land of which I swore to them, and I will be with you. So he's telling Joshua to be strong and of good courage. Why? Because Joshua is going to have a lot, of, a lot of struggles and trials and tribulations, and we all do, especially if we're doing it for the Lord. Satan is going to try to attack us. The most, um, the, the, if you're going through trials and tribulations because of the Lord, it's because you're a threat to Satan. He wants to destroy you, distract you, deceive you. And that's why God is saying, be strong and of good courage, Joshua, because you're going to bring many into my, in, into my covenant. And that's why he needed that strength and courage that only the Lord, Jehovah, Elohim, could provide. Verse 24, so it was when Moses had completed the writing of the words of this law in a book, when they were finished, that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, Take this book of the law and put it besides the Ark of the Covenant of the Jehovah your Elohim, that it may be there as a witness against you. It is a witness, two words of my witness. The book of the law, the, the Ten Commandments were inside, the staff, and the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord, the covenant, the everlasting covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That is God's land, and it will be his remnant. Those who love him and are obedient to him will inherit that land forever. Even Gentiles grafted in. Uh, verse 27, For I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? So he knows, Moses knows that they're going to rebel. And God always had a plan for a new covenant through the blood of Jesus Christ. We know that in Jeremiah 31, 31. And isn't it interesting? And it's Jeremiah 31, 31, which is the number of Jehovah. And in Jeremiah 31, 31, he says, I have a new covenant better than the old. And that covenant is through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ, God in the second head. Praise his holy name. So he always had a plan, always had a plan. And there's a plan for the stiff-necked people. He was going to use the Gentiles. And, and the Gentiles were going to uh, be God's people, being grafted in, being the church. That's why Paul was going after the Gentiles to bring them in and as a witness and to bring a, a jealous heart so that they would come back to seek the Lord. And they will in the end days. And they are starting to more than any time in history. Gather to me all the elders of your tribes and, uh, and your officers that I may speak these words in the hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. Amazing. Praise his name. 
Verse 29, for I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt, and it's exactly what happened, and turn aside from which way I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of Jehovah to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. Thinking your hands and your traditions are doing it. No, it's always been the heart. God has wanted the heart. No traditions. Remember the Pharisees and the Sadducees got too wrapped up in the law and the, and the traditions and, 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 and got too strict in that and forgot the love. The love is the most important thing. If you don't have love, you don't have anything. God is a God of love. He wants the heart. He wants obedience because he knows his ways are, are going to keep you safe from harm. It's not that he's a strict father. He's a loving father. If you go into areas he tells you that are against his commandments, trouble will follow. And we see that all our lives. When we're not obedient to the Lord, bad things happen. And when we look back 10 years ago or 20 years or how long ago it was of the things that you did in the sin nature that you thought were pleasurable at the time, you look back and think, why did I think those were pleasurable? They were just, they were, they were hurtful. God is maturing you and giving you the wisdom that can only come through him, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of indwelling in you and protecting you and being obedient to his law. And his law is, is gracious and his law is love. He is a God of love. And we close out in verse 30. Then Moses spoke in the hearing of all the assembly of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. Praise the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy 31, the number of the Most High God. We pray that this has been a blessing to you. May the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob bless you. And the God of David bless you and, his, and our Messiah, Jesus Christ. And we will see you next time on Deuteronomy 32. God bless you.